now here in the northern border of Belize, next to Mexico. And there's a fascinating story about this family. It's a family of 10 that lives in a uh, one bedroom house. And their son, Moses, right here, was accidentally run over by a truck that caused his abdomen to become exposed. Heard by Tim Tam and the word of work that he was able to save his life. Presbyterian Church, as well as Kenny, who you already know, they're going to plan on doing an addition to this family's house that will extend the house twice as much. There's uh, 10 children, a mom and a dad that live here, and uh, Moses right now, the child that was deathly uh, injured, was taken to um, a hospital in, uh, in Amarillo, Texas, and he was saved. He's now uh, gaining weight, and he'll soon come back to Belize, but he was in dire straits. But anyways, this is just another story here in Belize, and another group that are uh, trying to reach out to the police. Uh, Moses' father, um, the injured child who uh, was flown to um, Texas, um, and uh, Albert's going to do some translating. But, but what happened? ¿Qué pasó con tu hijo? Bueno, um, sinceramente, ¿de qué, de qué es lo que me interesa ver? Um, he really wants to know exactly what you want to know. Well, we, we've heard in the States about uh, the miracle child, the child who was gravely injured. Los Estados Unidos, el muchacho de milagro. Y quieren escuchar qué pasó en el accidente. ¿Cómo pasó? ¿Cómo se lastimó? Supuestamente, este camión es el que estaba en reparación, este uno acá, ¿no? Okay. Truck that we see over here was it being fixed. Yeah. He's going to explain how how it happened. Great. There was some um, some wood here. Yeah. See. Bueno, entonces había un trozo como como así. There was a trunk, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a big wooden trunk. Right. Stump. Bueno. Well, so high. He was fixing, uh -huh. we were fixing this vehicle. Entonces como las cinco y media aproximadamente le dije yo, pues no lo vimos adentro, ¿no? About 5.30 in the afternoon, uh -huh. they had gone inside. Sí. Entonces agarramos, y yo y mi esposa, todos los estábamos desarmando, armando, entonces ese rato lo vimos para adentro, ya, ya casi está, ya no se miraba mucho allá, entonces no lo vimos para adentro y... Um, they were taking things in after finishing the day, and uh, then. Entonces, pues, cuando oímos, subimos a tomar agua. Went to drink water. Oímos que que mi hija gritó que él se había caído de arriba. The daughter screamed that um, that the son had fallen from above. Wow. Entonces, aproximadamente cuando yo llegué donde estaba la piga tirado así, él cayó de de espalda, ¿no? When he arrived there, he he noticed that um, he had fallen on his back, and that the trunk, the tree trunk, had fallen on top of his midsection. Oh, oh. They can get a little closer. Uh -huh. So, when you went to the doctors here, were they able to help, or what, what, what did they say? What was the prognosis? Cuando ustedes fueron al doctor aquí, los doctores podían ayudar, y ¿qué decían? Bueno, el problema de los doctores aquí, bueno, cuando llevamos aquí en el hospital de, de Corozal. The problem of the doctors uh, here, when they went to Corozal. Uh, media, como media hora después, lo llevaron a... a Supuestamente iban a Orinjok, pero dijeron que no recibían ese rato, le trataron a venirse directo. About half hour later, the doctors here said they were going to they were going to transfer him to Orange Walk, but they then decided to transfer him directly to Belize City. Wow. Bueno, entonces supuestamente el siguiente día dijeron que lo van a operar para ver qué tiene en su su barriga, ¿no? Supposedly the next day the doctors had decided that they were going to operate to see exactly what was the problem. Entonces tenía un golpe acá. There was a a 
a, a bruise. He got hit here in the back. Okay. Bueno, entonces lo operaron ese día y el doctor dijo la siguiente semana se va a ir. The, the doctors did operate him and they said that the next week he would go. Uh -huh. mm. Que ya va a salir bien, dijo todos también. Everything sí, no. was going to turn out well. Entonces, supuestamente eh, mi suegra quedó eh, al, al cuidado de él. Por ese día nosotros venimos a cruzar por el bebé que teníamos de tres meses, aproximadamente de tres meses en esos días, ¿no? My mother-in-law stayed at the hospital that evening and they came back because they had a child that was basically three months old and needed to be taken care of. Oh, yeah, okay. Ah, sí. How many children do you have? ¿Cuántos hijos tiene? Um, ella o todos, por todos. Todos, todos. Okay. todos. Por todos somos, son de ellos son nueve. Nine. Nine. Ah, nueve. Okay. Bueno. Entonces, nosotros estábamos contentos, contentos porque el doctor dijo que todo salió bien. They were very happy uh, because yeah. the doctor had said that everything turned out well. Okay. Bueno, entonces, cuando dijo, cuando el niño despierte, um, alimentenlo. When the child wakes up from the, um, after the operation, feed him. Uh, yeah. Dijo él que, que le, den, le den toda clase de comida porque ha perdido mucha sangre en la operación. Give him all kinds uh -huh. of food, whatever, all different uh, yeah. kinds because he had lost a lot of blood in yeah. the operation. Uh -huh. Entonces yo le dije a mi suegra que eso no era bueno porque está recién operado. And he said to uh -huh. his uh, mother-in-law that this doesn't sound right because he was just operated. Yeah. Ajá, uh -huh. y entonces mi suegra dijo que los doctores son los que mandan y nosotros no tenemos nada que... que una palabra que, que sea más mejor que de ellos. And the, the, the mother-in-law said, we really don't have any say in this. The doctors know what they're saying, so yeah, we're going to follow yeah. his instructions. Okay. Sí. Bueno, entonces, yo le dije a mi suegra que todo recién operado tiene que tener una dieta. So, he said to his uh, mother-in-law that normally uh, those who are recently operated have a special diet. Mm -hmm. Entonces, um, cuando nosotros venimos, el niño despertó y el siguiente día ella le dio um, una comida con pimienta y chile. So, okay. the next, when they did come home, the, the mother-in-law gave Moises a food that had um, pepper and pimienta. And, 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 ch and hot pepper. Okay. So black pepper and hot pepper. Okay. Bueno. Entonces comenzó él a vomitar, a vomitar. He began to vomit Ooh. and vomit and vomit. So there were complications after the surgery. Entonces había complicaciones Entonces, después de la sí. cirugía. And then how did, and it, it just, his, his intestines became inflamed or what Entonces, was it? Entonces se hinchó su barriga. Se inflamó. Uh -huh. Se hinchó su barriga. They, they started to um, swell and they were infected. So then at that point, where did uh, uh, Tim Tam come in and you flew to Texas? How did that happen? Cuando entró Tim Tam y cuando fueron ustedes a llevar el niño a Texas? Él entró después de cinco operaciones. He came in after five different operations. Four. Oh, operaciones. Nothing would help. No. Nothing, nothing would help. help. It did not help. Cinco it, operaciones llevó el niño acá en Five Luis. operations in the city of so, so at that point, the son, it, it was, he could potentially die from this because nothing. Entonces en ese punto el muchacho podía de morir. Um, en cada operación que le hacían, él va menos y menos y menos ya cortándose su vida. Every operation that they did, his life slowly but surely was ebbing away. Wow. Que los doctores dijeron de que ya no tiene cura en ninguna parte del mundo. The doctors had told them that there was no cure in, mm. uh -huh. in nowhere in the world. Wow. Uh -huh. y, y supuestamente a mí ya no me permitían verlo a él. They would not allow him to come and see him. Ajá, porque supuestamente yo soy su padrazo de él, ¿no? Mm. I, I am the uh, stepfather. Ajá. Mm -hmm. Entonces, mi suegra llegó con un montón de mentiras al hospital. The mother-in-law arrived at the hospital with all kinds of lies. Okay. Y, y supuestamente pues ella no, no, no sabía nada de todo lo que había pasado porque nosotros la llamamos el día del accidente. Supposedly she did not really know uh -huh. what was going on. Mm. En el calle la llamamos nosotros como a las nueve de la noche de lo que había sucedido. So then they flew him to Texas? How did that happen? Entonces, 
lo llevaron a Texas lo por avión. Por avión, ajá. El, sí, eso fue lo que mi tintano dijo nosotros que iban a tener un avión para llevarlo allá. ¿no? Yeah, so they, um, they had said that they were going to take him on a, a plane to Texas. And then that surgery worked. Entonces esa cirugía funcionó. Ese fue el bueno que... Okay. That went very well. Okay. Uh -huh. I remember they were saying uh, before that he had one bowel movement. Right. And this was like the miracle bowel movement. Él está recordando que después de la operación, él tuvo un... Él tenía que ir, ir a hacer popó. Uh -huh. Y eso fue el popó mi, milagroso. <laughs> that it? No, ya está para Because it was like a miracle. Yeah, for them it was, uh, it was a, a very good, uh, happy time. So this happened, this happened in January. Eso pasó en enero. And now, the 8th of, the 8th of January. Uh, January. And now it's, now it's coming up on August and he will return within a month? Ahora estamos en agosto y supuestamente va a regresar en un mes. Un mes. Well, there might be people watching. I don't know if he wants to say, you know. Um, hay algunas personas que tal vez uh, están involucrado en todo el proyecto. Tal vez va a querer decir gracias a esas personas. Sí, correcto. Sí, es positivo. Gracias a todas las personas que, que los, están, los apoyaron y los que los están apoyando. Thank you for Como, all the people um, who have supported and are supporting. Especialmente a Mr. Tim, ¿no? Tim Tan, Especially que, to Tim Tam. Que por gracias a Dios que lo puso a él Thanks en nuestro God, camino para... Uh, he was put in para, their path. Para ayudarlos con nuestro hijo que ya se estaba muriendo. To help with their son who was dying, but now... Ajá, y me siento alegre porque pues ya se regresó a la vida. I'm, pues, I'm very happy because he's got life again. Ajá, uh -huh. y gracias a Dios y gracias a toda la gente que nos está apoyando. Thanks to God and thanks to all those who right. Yo espero que Dios nos ayude y les, les and, siga ayudando siempre. And he wishes that God would bless all of them who have supported him. This is todo, todo, todo mi deseo, porque si esta gente no existiera... This, this is my desire, sí. because if these people did not exist, where sí. would Moises be today? Mm. Nuestro hijo se los hubiera muerto. He, Pero, the, our son would have been dead today. Oh. Pero Dios puso a Mr. Tintan como una medicina. Um, para, God put para Tim Tam para. as a medicine in yeah. their in their path. Y estoy muy agradecido, muy agradecido Very con todas esas personas. With all these people. <laughs> okay, gracias, gracias. Thank you for talking. With Moses' sisters, and how many children are in the family? Um, only right here, um, with Moses, I mean... With, with Moses, there are nine children. Okay, and you live here, and they're, they're putting an addition on in the back? Yeah. Okay. Well, what happened to Moses? Um, um, we were playing up um, in the truck, and the, the back way come up. Oh, the, the dump truck uh -huh. sort of thing? Okay. And then we have um, firewood, and then he, well, he was playing with one of them. Right. And me and my sister and he, Manuel, okay. yeah. we were playing too. And okay. then when we suddenly see he, he dropped down, and then he got hurt, my father took him to the hospital. Right. But there wasn't anything that they could do in the hospital here in Belize, so he went to Texas? Yeah. He then carried him to Belize, um, because they said they had and then immediately they took him to Belize. Right. But, uh, huh. and, and then they took him up to Texas. But have you heard good news? That he's getting better, he's he's gain, he's able to eat food now? Yes. And they and he's gonna be coming back home too. Yeah. So anyways, well thank you for sharing your story. I'm Ingrid, I go to Wilson High School. This is what? Yeah. next to me <laughs> from Belize. All right, and young lady, where are you from? From Ridgefield, Connecticut. How many times have you been down here to Belize? I think this is my fourth, okay. And why in the world do you take your summer vacation and come down here and work in this hot sun? Because it's fun. Uh -huh. And next? I'm Elsa, and I'm from Wilton. Yeah. All right, and wow. have you been down here before? I've been down here, but this is my first time on this trip. All right, and what do you think of it so far? Um, I think this is more satisfying than a vacation. 
Well, that's what you get. These are volunteers from Fairfield County. They go to Hope Church in Wilton, Connecticut. Some people go to Walnut Hill Community Church in Bethel, and we're here to work. It's just incredible working at the burial ground. It's a prim, pretty primitive construction site. I don't think there are any OSHA personnel to come around and make sure you're working at a safe work site. It's fun having uh, high school age kids from Fairfield County put down their black and their iPods and come to this country that's obviously a developing country and work hard. There's a young lady from uh, Wilton High School. She's going to go on to Brown University. Uh, the kids are everywhere. They're always willing to help. They're always willing to lend a hand. Last year when we came to the same area and we were working on the first floor of that school, it was such a blessing because we had taken an entire uh, semi-truck full of school furniture and books and desks, even right down to the chalkboards and the uh, pencil sharpeners from a school that they were closing in Rhode Island. And it was, it was just wonderful to see those same kids that are helping um, uh, right now uh, unload that, that truck. But there they are, swinging shovels. Sometimes uh, it made a one-hour job turn into a two-hour job with them helping. But uh, their heart's in the right place, and they're actually building a school that they're going to later go to. We are here with Kenny Logan. Kenny Logan is on staff with the world at, with the Word at Work, and he's really the guy that puts together all the pieces that help construct this uh, this church here in the area. Kenny, how did you first get started with the Word of Work? Uh, it was uh, 2005. I was coming home from the U.S. and I sat on a plane in a seat that I wasn't supposed to be sitting in. Okay. Next to the director for the Word at Work, Tim Tom. Tim Tom, the legendary Tim Tom. That's right, the legendary. Why don't know the Tim Tom? And uh, after coming, filling out my immigration paperwork, he said that I'm a Belizean. And so he says, hey, you got a minute? Can I show you some things? And I said, yeah, you can. And start showing me pictures of people and places that I have recognized and been friends with pretty much for a long time. And I says, but I know these people. And I used to work with this one. And so he says, well, what do you do? And I says, well, I'm a builder. That's what I do. And he said to me, he says, well, I bring groups here and I'm looking for somebody that is local that knows what's going on and, and what to do and to kind of lead my folks around. And I said, well, if I'm not busy, I can do that for you because I enjoy that kind of thing. Since 2006 to now, I'm not busy. I'm still doing the exact same thing. <laughs> so you met Tim accidentally on a plane. Right. And then you perfectly jived up with people what you're able to do, build things. You can do electrical, you can do plumbing, you can do concrete, you can do stucco, you can do anything. Right. All right, and you, and you put together groups. Exactly. All right, excellent. Now I'm telling you, Kenny is the man. He's the brains behind the operation. Well, we're here at uh, the Special Outreach Community Development Center, uh, and it was also sponsored by the Word of Work. That's the guy, Tim Tam, which we'll be a day later. Also, some other Belizean organizations that come together. This building was actually put together by a large Mennonite community that's lived in Belize for quite some time. They've prefabricated these houses and they're dropped here. This is a training center where kids can come in for tutoring and special um, uh, help with school, and it also serves as a cafeteria for the school that continues to be built over there. So let's go inside and take a look. Can you show me? Come on in. This is a special tutoring center that they have here at, uh, at the Burial Ground School. And these fine young ladies are from Colorado. What's your name? I'm Courtney. Courtney, and who are you tutoring here? Oh, what is your name? Jose, yes. Jose, all right. He's also known as Tony Montana. <laughs> uh, you're working on reading, that's great. Yes. And then we have another uh, young lady over here. What's your name? Hi, I'm Becca. And where do you go to school? Um, C.U. Boulder. C.U. Boulder. All you girls go to the University of Colorado Boulder. And what brings you down here to the very hot burial grounds in uh, Belize City? Uh, the kids. <laughs> How did you hear about this uh, ministry? Well, we were in Honduras. Honduras? <laughs> yeah, we were. Well, we, we were on a mission trip to 
Worship in Honduras. Diane. And then there's a road trip. I hate when that happens. So, okay. yeah. Wrecked your mission trip. <laughs> and we were supposed to be there for seven weeks. So a little before a week passed when we returned home, they sent us here. Oh, okay. so I walked on seven weeks old. Yeah. Alright, what's this young man's name? Becca. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. His name is Becca. Yeah, there's... Lauren. Lauren. What you, what's your major in school? Um, I am a psychology major and biology, and I'm also doing elementary education. Very good. Yeah, teacher. And you're working right now. Who's your young uh, student? Tomorrow. 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 Well, thanks a lot. So this is the training center and the tutorial. It also works as a cafeteria for these kids during the school year. And it's just part of the word of work and everything that's going on here in Belize City. Okay, we are here in a, in a special place of um, Belize. It's called the, the uh, Valley of Peace. And we're here with Benjamin Maya and Herbert Flores. And Herbert, you're the principal of this school. Yes, I Why don't you tell us a little bit about your school? Well, actually, it's a very large school. It's uh -huh. uh, 14 teachers in all and wow. uh, 347 students. Okay. So mm -hmm. it, it uh, goes from infant one all the way to standard six, where the students are prepared to take the PSE, okay. national exam, to go to high school. Okay, right, so we have a um, the majority of students are, are mestizo, right? Or and that's a special Indian. Uh, yeah, it's a mixture of uh, the Spanish, Spanish, and, right. and the, the, the Maya, right. right? And then we have the Kechi, also, right? Okay. Who have come from south and also from Guatemala. They are in our school. Okay. We have a few um, Creoles as well. And Benjamin, we were sp speaking earlier about this area, the Valley of Peace. Where did it originally come from? Where, where, where are the origins of, uh, of the people coming and migrating to this area? Yeah, most of the, um, the people came from El Salvador. Um, they came as refugees uh, fleeing the civil war that was going on there back in 1980, 1981. And um, the government saw the need of bringing all these people together in one place and so they started this refugee settlement working with um, the uh, UNHCR, okay. United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. They got together and then they started uh, this settlement but um, they were trying to integrate the immigrants um, into the Belizean society so from the start they brought um, a certain amount of um, Salvadoran families along with some Belizean families oh. so that the Salvadorans could learn the Belizean ways and then the Belizeans can learn the, the um, Salvadoran ways in terms of agriculture because most of the people here earn their living from agriculture okay. so um, the government thought that they could learn some agricultural methods from the Salvadorans so and it has worked uh, fine up to this point. Okay, and that, now we're, we're in uh, Belize City right now, we're working in the burial grounds, that area, through uh, the Word at Work with Tim Tam. How did you first meet Tim Tam, and what, and how did he become associated and, and try to help, you know, support what you're doing here? What, what's that connection? Okay, um, um, first um, I met uh, the owner of Banana Bank, so John yeah. Carr. John Carr, we don't yes. he's the guy with the cowboy hat yes. we talked to him earlier. Yeah. Um, there was a girl from here, from Valdez, working there at Banana Bank. Mm -hmm. Her name is Magdalena Portillo. Right now she's in the States. Now, what happened is that um, she started getting him involved in the community here right. in Valley of Peace. And um, eventually uh, we got to meet him. Um, I was introduced to him. And then um, at the, around the same time, Tim Tam came along and he asked uh, Mr. John Carr if there was anybody in, in the community here, a pastor or somebody from the church, who could um, be the connection with Word at Work. Right. And so, um, I, I don't know why, <laughs> maybe it was, it was God. Uh, We're hearing a lot of that with the <laughs> Word at Work, where it was just a coincidence that Kenny was in an airplane with him. It was just a coincidence mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. Deborah exactly. from the oil company yeah. was sponsored. So there's so, a lot of coincidences. I think God is, God's hand is, is, is in all of this. So it was then that um, John Carr brought him down here. I was a teacher at this school, right? so we were introduced. I am also um, a leader in the Catholic Church. So 
uh, from then on this we started working hmm. and we started working in three particular areas first it was housing right and then um, health and education those are the three areas that we are trying to uh, improve in this community here in Valley of Peace Wow okay well listen I appreciate very much letting us say, and I, I think that the name the Valley of Peace is is a perfect name for this area because as we drove out here from the city in Belize where a lot of traffic a lot of people you come out here and you really do get a, a sense of peace yeah peace, that's so, right and then, if I can tell you something about the history of the name yeah uh, because I am one of those um, children who came from El Salvador you were a refugee yes, from the war in El yes, Salvador yes. in the 1980s. So, okay. uh, like, I am one of those, um, I would say, original settlers here in, in Valley of Peace. Yeah. I don't know, were you one I of guess them? we came in the second, second the phase. The second phase, because it was wow. done in phases. So, um, the, the community got together, and they decided that they want a name for the community. So, several names were suggested. And uh, there was a Belizean, I don't recall his name, but he said um, they had chosen... Um, Monsignor Romero, um, was Rutilio Grande, oh. those were um, martyrs of the war in El Salvador. Oh, okay. okay, so they were choosing those names, and then but they settled to, on Valley of Peace because the Belizeans said these people are coming from a, a war-torn country and they come here and they have found peace. So the appropriate name for this will be Valley of Peace, and then it can be translated very easily into Spanish and English. So it's Valle de Paz in Spanish. Okay. That's why the the name stick Valley of Peace. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, listen, thank you very much. Thank you for showing us your school. Good luck when all the students come back in September. Thank you. And it was a pleasure meeting you as well. Thank you. thank you very much. And now we'll continue with the program. Uh, this is our computer lab. We're working on it presently. Yeah. These computers are being donated by our work, Reverend Tim Town. Um, we are hoping to get a few more so that we can uh, set up for. Uh, not only our library, because we're working on a library as well, but in the computer lab. At this point, our students have been at a disadvantage because when they go to high school, the majority of them are unable to, to, to work on a computer. But if we have computers here, it's easier for them to be able to, to, to work on one. Right? So it's uh, really something that is. Uh, we inspire our students, we motivate our students, and I'm really glad that this is being done from where we work. Uh, we're also working on the, you know, our um, bookshelves, as we're planning to set up our library here. Um, we we'll set up furniture, desk, center desk here, so the students can come and do their research. We have obtained a lot of books from uh, where we work again, but we don't have a school library as yet. So we are planning to, at the beginning of the school year, which is in August, um, we are hoping to have it set up so that our students can use it. Are you saying this is a project? Yes. Um, uh, we had um, only the foundation over there when Tim Tam came along with his team and they helped us to put up the walls and uh, the plumbing inside. Also. There was an expert there plumbing abilities and he was the one who helped us to put the plumbing inside. And this is a, a retreat center? Yes, it's going to be okay. a retreat center. It is, is this a church? It's a Catholic church. Catholic church here. Very interesting. Very interesting. We're here with Carolyn Heiser. What have you done this past week? devastatingly healthy and um, we cleaned them and structured them and organized them and gave some of the teachers some skill to stay organized and um, enabled them to proceed with the following year um, which is lesson plans rather than trying to figure out how to structure their classroom. How many times have you been down here in Belize? Third. This is my third year. And what what's goes through your mind when you think of spending a week down here, rolling up your sleeves with buckets and mops and sponges and bleach and cleaning a classroom? Doesn't sound like a relaxing vacation to me. Actually, compared to my normal life, it is relaxing. Um, it was actually fun to um, clean and to see an immediate result of work and some thought. That was really fun too, and um, you know, 
know, they're all really um, hardworking teachers. They really have a heart for the kids in this community, and uh, um, they're just incredibly appreciative. Thanks for taking some time. There's certain people you meet in your life that you can consider real heroes. This man in the beard, John Wood, is one of those men. He has a large construction company in uh, the country of Belize. He was actually building roads. He's quite prosperous. He's building a road outside this prison, and he comes to find out that the prison held 900 prisoners, but it was only designed to hold 300. There were only 300 beds. As he talks about in the interview, some of the conditions were just primitive and horrific. And him being a, being a Christian man, uh, seeing an opening uh, to do a bit of the Lord's work, he took on this prison. And it was just a real privilege to meet him and see him interact with the prisoners, as you'll see in some of the clips ahead. Also, he had a chance to have an extended interview with him. And he talks about uh, the Colby Foundation and his work with Prison Fellowship, which is a ministry that was originally started by Chuck Colson. John Wood a modern day saint and one of my heroes. We're here with John Woods. John Woods is a, is a very successful businessman here in Belize and he's going to tell us a little bit of the background of how he came along to this uh, Central Belize prison and the effect that he had. But I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. John Woods. Good. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, the funny story, I didn't, didn't really know anything about prison, but I've lived in Belize since 1969. Came here, met my wife here, had five children. And uh, I'm a contractor. I build roads, bridges, those kind of things. And I was building the road out in front. The then minister of prisons asked me to form a group of businessmen to advise on the management. And we came in here and we were absolutely horrified at what we saw. Huh. That there were up to 12 people in an 8 by 10 cell. There were people uh, that they would feed them in their cells, they'd come along with a bucket, and if they didn't have a plate, they gave it to them in their hands and they ate out of their hands. Wow. There were 900 prisoners in here at that time, and there were only 300 beds. There was no potable water that was being trucked in. If the truck broke down, then they had to drink the brackish water that was in the pipes. Uh, it was horrible, but the worst thing was that when you'd walk along and look at people, most of them weren't looking back. There were, there were dead eyes, you know, there was nobody there, nobody home. They had just, I, I, I took it, you know, all of the things that you've learned growing up, you know, you treat somebody like an animal, he becomes an animal, well, I thought that was very happy, because they were certainly treated like animals, they just didn't care. And yet these are the people who were sending back out on the streets. Huh. So none of this, as a businessman, you like win-win situations, and this was not a win-win situation. Yeah. So, well, what was the time period of this? This was in 2000, 2001. 2001, you're building the road out here. Right. You happen upon the prison, you find a mess, what happens next? Well, uh, I accepted the challenge to form a group of businessmen, and we came in, and then we just started. I noticed when I was here that everybody would stand at attention and show me great respect. But I was gone because I was building, you know, roads and things. So I asked the minister if I paid for it, could I hire a permanent replacement for me, somebody that would be here all the time. Yeah. Because I was trying to raise money for the overcrowding was horrible, the conditions of the place were horrible. And he said, sure. So I hired this guy, the then CEO that was on the, right. on the movie. And he had been a construction guy with me, uh, been run a camp for me in tough conditions. Black belt, karate, fearless, and a lot of common sense. And he started. Good combination, black belt and common sense. Yeah. Uh -huh. He he had a he came in and he just started documenting everything. And then every time I would see the prime minister after that, I would give him the story of what we were finding. Huh. And one time in frustration, he says, "Why don't you take it over and run it yourself?" Of course, I said, "Sure." <laughs> then I went to the Rotary Club and I said, "Hey guys, we got a chance to." manage a prison. We really put our money where our mouth is. Let's wow. get involved. Government gives us a per diem. We get about, uh, we started at $6 a day, and now I think we're up to six fifty U.S. per day per prisoner. Wow. But out of that, we have to pay all the employees, all of the food, all of the expenses here. Seems like a pretty so, tight budget. It's man. unbelievably tight. Yeah. I mean, you'd say, well, let's give the guys a, a piece of cheese in the morning with their piece of bread, you know? Yeah. But when you look at the cost, because we started with 900 
record, but we were rocking along right away with 1,100, 1,200. Now we're up to 1,400. Uh, we almost hit 1,500 last month. Uh, but we've got a lot of people here, so everything you do, just multiply it by that 1,500 people, and if you get the costs on it. Now, Prison Fellowship, is that Chuck Colson's ministry? Chuck Colson. Okay. We had the, our board, we had our board of made up of most of Rotarians. Right. And the first thing, what are the goals of Colby? We came up with Colby because it was the name of an old priest that died in Poland. He died at Auschwitz. He was a, a missionary and he came home and the Nazis were there and he, en he ended up in prison right away. <laughs> he ended up giving his life for another prisoner, so they made him a saint. All right. When we were looking for a name of this place, somebody suggested Colby and we said, sure, why not? You know? Wow. And uh, then we had our board from, from Rotary, which is, I guess, not really Christian, but it, you know, a lot of good people in there. And the basis of what we came up with, everything, was based on the fact that we believe, firmly believe, that everybody's created in the image and likeness of God. Uh -huh. So we came up with this, uh, the goals to, to run a secure prison right. for society, but also secure uh, for them to be here without being, being damaged, and a secure place for us to work. And then humane, which says it all. And then the third thing was meaningful rehabilitation. And then I got a knock on the door, and this little old lady was here, and she says, you know, I've been coming to the police for years, and I've done some work in prison, but I've worked in a Chuck Colson prison, and I know about rehab. Was that the know. lady in the video? Yes. Okay. And she said, would you let, let me come out? So we had meetings, and we gave her the worst building we had. But she's recruited, and what a tough lady, and she came in here and just showed us what rehab was. Now, since the time you found it, with, with you know deplorable conditions, you upgraded the living conditions, yes. and how? What is the recidivism? Okay. Well, well, how how is how have we seen improvement? Well, we took that? over in in 2002. The recidivism rate was 70 percent. Out of one, every hundred people that served their time in here, 70 of them came back. Yeah. We have seriously tracked it for the last three years after we have all our rehab programs right. in place and we're really putting the message across. It's 13% now. Out of every 100 people that have served their time and released, 13 of them are coming back in. So we're, we're doing something right because those are world-class figures. And that's, boy, I can show you names, numbers, everything on it. Wow. You know, we do have, I'm sorry for the 13, some of them are kind of high, high profile and yeah. got some damage, but uh, we are doing something right. In that is incredible. And I think the biggest thing is we let God is in church. We had a board meeting this morning, I mean, we had a management meeting this morning. And we asked him to be there with us and to guide us on every step. I was serious about it. Sometimes from the, from the Christian point of view, you know, the... the People will say, oh yeah, you you know, you Christians are all pie in the sky and everything's going to be good in the by and by, but what about right now? But here's a case where Christian businessmen rolled up their sleeves, saw a problem, and got their hands dirty and got into it, and you're seeing benefits of your Christian worldview played out here in the It's absolutely amazing. The yeah. things I see in here on a daily basis keep me going. Wow. I see God's miracle. If I want to find God... I find him up here all the time. Wow. It's usually in somebody that you don't figure is good. You know? Well, we've been doing some work at the burial ground in Belize City. So you see the the, work. where our intake comes from. Yeah, yeah. That When I saw it in the videotape, that looks very familiar with some of those streets. Sure. But it's interesting there, too, because where you had a, a, a really downtrodden community, you can see where the church and now a school's being built and it's beginning to be built. I mean, you can see the kingdom of God coming to that portion. And what I see happening here at this prison is that with you and the other Christian businessmen, as we're seeing the kingdom of God come to this forgotten little corner of Belize. And I would love if you could take us around and show sure, us what I'm you can. All right, let's, 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 let's take a look. Okay. Bye. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry. I wish I was better dressed, but we're down here working on churches and stuff like that. We're dressed for Belize. We're dressed for Belize. We're here with um, Tim Tam, the Word of Work. We're working down at the burial grounds. And uh, Tim, Tim just called from Texas and said, we absolutely have to see uh, uh, John and what you're doing here because it's a pretty incredible story. So. It's exciting. And, it, and the beauty of it is it's so exciting because so much of it's out of the box. We're right. always doing things that aren't done. We have a family day coming up. Okay. We have the families of the inmates 
come into prison. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We'll have this. Uh, we've had as many as 3,400 people in here on one day. Right. Now we've changed it into two days instead of one day, so we have a more manageable crowd. Well, from what I see coming in, a prison with its own radio station is being run, a prison with its own gift shop where you're producing income for the prison, and a prison where you have you know patron saints and Christian Bible studies by women that are maybe 98 pounds. So far, very impressive. <laughs> Thank you. When you walk with John Wood through the hallways of some of these prisons, you don't know exactly how to act, but the men are so delighted to see, well, first John Wood, and if you're with him, I guess they're delighted to see you as well. They like to have visitors, they're eager to reach out and shake your hands, and it was an incredibly powerful experience. prisoners, when you talk to them, they were eager to tell their story. The man we just talked to was eager to say, after spending 16 years in this prison, to get the word out through the camera that kids don't end up like me. This man that put together these carvings, these wood carvings, is in prison uh, for a double homicide. He's coming up here right on your right. Um, however, there were extenuating circumstances and it apparently was really a self-defense situation. But he's taking his time in prison and he's putting together these wood carvings that are just absolutely gorgeous. Hey, Marty Heiser. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, man. I How you doing? Hey, hey. What? Serious game going on here? So we're here and this who's, who's is the, the prison within the prison. They call who's it the better? Supermax. Each man he has is? an individual he cell. These people, people are here because but of you're not your heinous you're crimes. Crime. And also One are here because of protective custody. So when you win, you make up. Other win? inmates have put on uh, some sort yes. of contact. <laughs> Jeopardy of losing their lives at the end with the regular inmate population. So this is the worst of the worst. Alright. This one. 
You by yourself? No, I oh. got that one here behind this door right there. Yeah. I'm Marty. I'm a friend of John Wood. That's yeah. my only yeah. friend. Yeah. 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 Him down. That's your only friend. Hey, Let's pop it, man. Yes, Poppy. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Hey. Hey, good to see you. Right? Yeah. Garcia. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mel, we lost Mel. <laughs> okay. How you doing? Are you Mr. Wade? Hello, it's a pleasure, Mr. Woods. Now, show me Good evening, sir. <laughs> sir? How do you do that? Well, I just take a little. No, Jesus. Man. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's 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 just to recreate their mind from sure, being in the four yes. I am <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right, guys. Have a nice day. Yeah, go on you, man. And he's, he's more protective, eh? Right? Yeah, he's pretty he's a pretty laid back guy. He's he's not like a problem. No, I know he's not a problem. No, he's on PC. He's on PC. Yeah. yeah. Be careful. PCP. Nobody, mm -hmm. Nobody protective for us all. You can take care of yourself. So sure, sure. keep your eyes open. Yeah. You know, he can't live amongst no. the uh, population outside, so, because they're more likely to want to do him something because of the person he is, you know? What happened with him? He was on a drug thing. Yeah. Claim drug thing? I don't know. What's the proper way to say those things? What do you know about him? Uh, what? About your case. Oh. Your alleged... Oh, like uh, involvement or something like. Man, how long? I don't want to explain those times. Yes, I know. Okay, yeah. Don't feel no pressure. You got no pressure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Bring him. 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 There are literally hundreds of thousands of Belizean nationals that live in America, primarily in uh, um, Los Angeles as well as New York City. They're very proud of their Belizean heritage. And this man that we met at the prison was in charge of 70 youth offenders. I asked him, and out of the, out of the 70 youth offenders that you'll see working out in, in some of these programs, 14 were in for murder, other for other charges. This young man was a former United States Army Ranger, and he wanted to bring some of what he learned from the U.S. Armed Forces back to Belize and, and hopefully to help with some of the young men that found themselves in the Belizean prison. It's, it, they work together, they work these young men, they give them a sense of pride and a sense of discipline, and it's really incredible to see how these Belizeans want to come back and give back and, bu and help build the country that they were born in. We're in a section of the prison for the criminally insane. We have an opportunity, believe it or not, to visit with two Americans. One's from just outside of Sacramento, California. The other's from Las Vegas. He's in apparently for having ammunition and it sounds like some drug-related charges. The other guy is in for mercy. But what we're seeing here is just absolutely taking my breath away as we see some of these primitive conditions. And when you consider that these conditions are an incredible vast improvement of what the prison used to be, it's really pretty incredible. In the background, you might be able to hear the rosary being said over the intercom. Previous to this, we saw a drug rehabilitation program that they had, as well as a youth program that's run by a former United States Army Ranger with all the uh, military uh, discipline and structure involved. So 
So this to me is really incredible. You said on ideas of working beyond taking in Belize, this is an opportunity to see a portion of Belize that you probably never saw on the tourist routes. So stay tuned and see what more there is to see. Yeah, you, end, you, end up here. you ever see the movie uh, Midnight Express? Midnight So what's so what's it like in here? I mean, for an American, is this like sometimes is this it can be really. Is this rough. your worst nightmare? You know, being stuck in a prison now? Actually, no, it's not. When, when did you come in? Last year, July 31st. Okay. At the end of this month, I'll be a, be a year. We got six left. Now, do you get do you get to move up to the different portions of the prison, or are you kind of stuck? In the I'm actually work back here. Really? So this is your job. So you've got a yes, job. Yes, I, 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 I stay up at six in the morning. Okay. To help and take care of these guys. This okay. is special care. Are there other Americans that are? Uh, I think there's a couple. Really? I think. Um, matter of fact, if you go over to 19, right. he's uh, he's an American. Oh, let's go in, uh, Raza. Where'd you get arrested in the airport? No, actually, I drove through customs two years before I got arrested. Oh, okay. This is another American. Where are you from? Really? LA. Yeah. How'd you end up here? Uh, Arson. What's that? Arson. Arson? Yeah. He burned a small section of wall, so they gave him five years. What were you doing in Belize that you... I'm broken. Your brother lives down here, so you're here and you were convicted of arson and you ended up in a prison. Right. Wow. Oh, my man, that was a good time to get things turned around. How long are you going to be in for? I got two two years more to go. Wow. Yeah. Uh, what about you in Los Angeles proper or outside of Los Angeles? Where are you from? I was born in LA, but okay. I used to live in Rancho Cucamonga. In what? Rancho Cucamonga. Uh, Alright, well hang in there. Don't break any of the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. As you walk around and meet some of these men that are incarcerated in uh, the Belize Central Prison, you're really taken back by uh, uh, just the difficulty of their lives. Yet at the same time, some of these men are coming back from and other people. This, young, this man in the middle here was a, is a professional wood carver. Belize as a country is known for its maritime wood, its hardwood, like its mahogany and these different woods and wood carving is a, is a really prized craft and this man uh, did the wood carving as they're demonstrating here the front door to the prison and uh, he really does an incredible job um, as you walk through and you saw uh, these men and their lives and what they go through you really don't know exactly what your reaction should be but one thing that I was struck by was how pleased the men were to just have a visitor Someone coming and showing some interest in what they're doing, some interest in their lives, uh, taking the time to come and, uh, and, and see them and meet them and greet them. And you could definitely tell the, uh, the love that they had for John Wood and the real transformation when you think about the way that conditions of this prison before John Wood and the Colby Foundation came in and uh, really turned over. It was a privilege to walk this prison with this man. He knew most of the prisoners on a first name basis. He asked him, did you get the toothpaste? Did you get the cigarettes? How's the appeal going in court? He knew about their families. You'll see there a man that walked by that didn't necessarily want his face to be caught on camera. So you got some of that as well. It was just a real privilege to be there.
that goes. Yeah. 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 And you also do um, like uh, information, you know, special yeah. meetings. But you do talk shows and stuff. People call in and whatnot. It's all in different buildings and things. Whenever I have any programs, uh, anything, uh, you got a call uh, in front of me. But do you, do you run a talk show here at night? I mean, do people call in from the different buildings and discuss, discuss different topics? Yes, I have, we have a new program here. I've been up, up at the school now. Mm -hmm. The past, present, and future program, we got a very run. Come a prison already and come back and uh, deliver messages to the brothers and that. How I messed up? That's why I messed up to come back into the prison and think and when I think they should have done now. And they prepare for when they reach all the back to not come back to prison. Wow. Real life stuff. Powerful, powerful, powerful. So, so you'll have a tie, you'll have a, uh, a former inmate who gets released and then gets convicted and comes back and you have a talk show about that so everyone can listen and hear. Yeah. Every, wow. From Monday to Friday, right. every, every day they bring someone new from each building. Wow. Participating in the program. Now, on the, in the outside world, do you, is this your job too? Are yeah, you a disc jockey? Do you work in radio? What's that? Yeah. Would you like to? Yes, sir. I like to practice. I practice. <laughs> no, you gotta go practice. Okay, do you have any, uh, do you know who Kirk Franklin is? CD? He's a gospel singer named Kirk Franklin? You don't have any Kirk Franklin. That would, that would have been my request. You have some Bob Marley. You have Christ Tafari? Bob Marley. Christ yeah, can you play Bob Marley? Sure. Oh, good. We got Willie Nelson, city of New Orleans. Denied that Christ was born. Thank you very much. luxurious but in a primitive sort of way so this is the capper motley crew it's ricardo's island ricardo it's ricardo's boat ricardo's ocean and ricardo's island 